For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, what if Joseph should bear a grudge against us and pay us back in full for all the wrong which we did to him? So they sent a message to Joseph saying, your father charged before he died saying, thus you shall say to Joseph, please forgive, I beg you, the transgression of your brothers and their sin, and they, uh, for they did you wrong. And now, please forgive the transgressions of the servants of God, of your father. And Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Then his brothers also came and fell down before him and said, Behold, we are your servants. Boy, this has gone a long way to get to the fulfillment, hasn't it, of that dream. Joseph said to them, don't be afraid, for am I in God's place? Of course, the answer is no. And as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. See, a lot of times you don't realize the bigger picture behind uh, Romans 8.28. Because there's always a bigger picture behind Romans 8, 28. When you fulfill that, that powerful little verse, a lot of stuff begins to move in the plan of God. And, and that's what David is saying. You meant evil for me, but God, but God meant it for good. In order to bring about the present results to preserve many people alive. I mean, that... I just want you to know there's a bigger picture behind everything that you do that is strategic in your life when, when God says, this is the directive will of God, do this. When you do that, not looking at the circumstances nor the results, but rather the obedience of it, God does some powerful stuff in your life. So therefore, do not be afraid, verse 21, I will provide for you and your little ones. So he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. That's a powerful act too, isn't it? I mean, these people were trying to kill him, sold him into slavery, uh, and he ministers to a deeply disturbed and hurting heart. He spoke kind words to them. So we're going to talk about that today. This is the second in a, in a, of this lesson we started last week on self-condemning guilt um, out, of, out of this experience of the brothers. So let's pause for a word of prayer. Give you a moment of silence as a believer, priest, and dwelt with the Holy Spirit, the privilege to confess sin if necessary. You are a believer, priest, according to 1 Peter 2. The question is whether or not you're spiritual. We live in the church age and spirituality is the name of the game. The Holy Spirit took up residence in you to, for, for you to be a spiritual person both in learning the Bible and living it. The problem is <clears throat> carnality. You still have a flesh, a sin nature. And there are times when we don't walk in the spirit, we walk in the flesh. And the result of that is personal sin. We call that carnality in First Peter, uh, in First Corinthians 3, 1 through 3. We call that carnality versus spirituality. Identity of carnality is personal sin. What you have to do to get back to spirituality is confess that sin. First John 1, 9 would be one verse. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us. Mental attitude, sin, sins of the tongue and avert sins. So I give you a moment, both those who are with us in the class study by automobile and those by internet, we expect the same classroom etiquette to be applied to our Bible study.
Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful tonight for these who have come our way, both by automobile and Internet. And we pray tonight, Father, as we study the Word of God on this issue of self-condemning guilt that have just eat these brothers up for 39 years. And in that same period of 39 years, it hasn't bothered Joseph because Joseph dealt with it in the issue of the beginning and, and it was resolved. Because it has not been resolved in the 10 brothers, it has become a major issue that has dominated their life. Every time something, some adversity came to their life, they went back to this episode and tried to explain what was going on in that God was doing was was disciplining them. Uh, along that 39 years, it would have been good for them to properly deal with this. But now it's come time to do it, and they've got the right man to help them with it. They've got Joseph, the offended one. And so we make our prayer, encourage our hearts. We made this prayer in Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> After 39 years of self-condemning guilt, we went through the math of it last time. The 10 brothers of Joseph, because <clears throat> Benjamin wasn't with them, he was at home. The 10 brothers that conspired against Joseph first to murder and then to sell him into slavery now desire and are seeking resolution to, the, to this problem in their life with Joseph. Here's the problem. They think they have to have Joseph's forgiveness to get on with their life. Listen, if they get it from Joseph, and they will, if they don't get it from God, it'll still continue. So don't make the mistake to think that if you go seek forgiveness of the other person, because let me tell you, all sin against God. All sin is against God. And while it may be directed to somebody else, it's still directed to God. And you might get clearance from somebody that you offended, and you still have gotten clearance with God because you haven't confessed it. Okay? So make sure. They're seeking Joseph's forgiveness. He could give it to them, and they could still, still be in hot water. Do you understand that? I mean, David said that. David said that he has sinned against man and God. I mean, sin is directed towards God. Even if it affects the other person, you still have to clean it up with him. So that's, that's, it's kind of an important issue because I don't know that people understand that. They do understand they ought to get it resolved with somebody else that they've, they've offended. But listen, that won't resolve it in your soul until you confess it as sin. You understand that? Okay. Then we'll, we'll get along tonight, all right? You see, sometimes it seems easier. Now, listen, because I, I hear this all the time. Sometimes it seems easier to focus on the cause of pain rather than on the cure of it. And so people keep focusing on the pain, the cause of the pain, and not the cure. Listen, you've got to focus on the cure of the pain. And that's what my lesson's intended to try to encourage you with. Sometimes it seems easier when you focus on the cause of pain to project blame to justify your pain. Even justify the pain that's come from bad decisions. And when you do that, then you, you quote, psychologically sweep it, sweep it under the rug, which means avoiding dealing with it. You know, there's a phrase they use today, kick the can down the road, which we used to say sweep it under the rug. This is the method the brothers have been using for the past 39 years. And it has got them nowhere as far as the guilt and the soul. It didn't work for them and it won't work for us. This was the method Adam and Eve used after they ate from the fruit. 
what did they do? They began to hide, sweep it under, right? They went into avoidance. Let's not deal with it. Let's not deal with it. Right? They went into hiding. Avoidance. That's avoidance. And it didn't work for them either. Why do we think it worked for us? It will not. It has to be confronted and dealt with in a proper way. The problem with resolution of self-condemning guilt is often the offended party, the offended party is not ready. Or the offender is not ready to apply God's spiritual solution to it. You say, sometimes, but listen, it's not dependent on the other party. I mean, at some point, it would be good to mend the fences. But in the meantime, you got to do what Joseph did. You got to get, get it right with God as the offended person. He took it to God and got healthy. And for 39 years, he's been healthy over the incident as the offended one. And the offenders still have guilt because they didn't take to God and get resolution. So there's a question posed. How is it possible that Joseph got resolution to it without the brother's acknowledgement of the offense against him? Right? Because he didn't get it. He's now getting it 39 years later. How is it possible that Joseph got resolution to this in his life without brother's acknowledgement of the offense against him? Right? I mean, he got, he's had this resolution. He's been, he's been, this, this problem's been over for 39 years as far as he's concerned. You know why? Because he took it to God and left it. As the offended person. Listen, it's way too much stuff to carry to keep it in. I don't care who's offended yet. I don't care how they offended yet. Do what Joseph did. Take it to God and leave it. Leave that issue in his hands because in your hands you can't do anything because you're too full of pain. How are you going to resolve that? Give it to God and when it comes time to do it, you'll be in a better state to be able to give kind words to somewhere you want to shoot. You, where you'd want to pay back evil for evil, insult for insult. That's not God's way. That is the world's way, but that ain't God's way. You see, I think this is a very important issue in the life of believers today, not just in past history. I think it's an issue today. We're still dealing with this stuff. I want to talk about Continuing our study on self fulfilling God, I want to give you four more points tonight. I want to give you four more points. Number one, the brother's unresolved self-condemning guilt is fearful, is now, is, is now eat up with fear. And it, it just expands all over. That pain just moves all over your soul. Once you got it in there, it just... Anything can trigger it, too. It doesn't have to be the brothers. It don't even have to be. It, I mean, it, this stuff can be triggered by most anything. And there you fall back into this place in your soul, and all that pain re resurfaces, and, and, quote, you have a bad day. They are now fearful. Their father's dead. Like, he, like, like their father is going to be the salvation of this. The only person that's going to fix this is God. That father, those are the, that, that father is not going to fix this. Well, anyhow. They were fearful, the Bible says, that Joseph might hold a grudge. That'd be some kind of grudge after 39 years. That'd be a club that would take four men to carry. <laughs> You'd have to have a gang to get any resolution with that club. 
in the 50th chapter, verse 15, it says, they say in, in their mind, they're thinking, what if Joseph bears a grudge against us and pays us back in full? That means taking you to the mat max. I mean, that's, that's getting you about as good as they could imagine getting you. See, everybody's got their own idea about what full would be. <laughs> you know, for some guys, he's going to run you over with, you with a Volkswagen with somebody else. You know, it's a semi-truck loaded, 18-wheeler, no brakes. Yeah. But you see, when you say holding a grudge and pay me back in full, Listen, their fool is criminal, right? Let's kill them. Let's sell them into slavery. That's full for them. Now, full for me might be not cooked dinner or something, but full for him, them guys? You see, it's based on their perception, isn't it? In fact, this whole thing is, how they would probably deal with it if Joseph done this to him, them, right? I'm just saying. What if Joseph pays back evil for evil? That's what they're thinking. What if Joseph pays back evil for evil and we get the evil to what they consider to be full, which, would, like I said, everybody's got their own idea full. But you know what? Listen, we know this to be absolutely true because we know the story. This was the farthest thing from Joseph's mind. You know why? Because God had taken as far as the east is from the west. You know, it would be good to use the Bible the way it was intended to use, not the way you want to use it, wouldn't it? <laughs> you know, you can always find a verse to fit your philosophy of life, but you have to take it out of context. Here's Joseph's new man, divine viewpoint thinking. That's N-M-D-V. New man, divine viewpoint thinking. Here's how Joseph thinks. Just like in Peter, 1 Peter, 3rd chapter, 9 through 10. To sum up, here's Joseph's thinking. To sum it all up. <laughs> how about all that? They got, these guys got 39 years of being eaten up. And Joseph, to sum it all up is the kind of the way he would approach this. Listen to what he said. This is what Peter said. To sum it all up, all of you be harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, humble in spirit, not returning evil for evil, insult for insult, but give a blessing instead. For you were called for this very purpose that you might inherit a blessing that was Joseph, wasn't it? Summed it all up. I'm going to be harmonious. I'm going to be sympathetic. I'm going to be brotherly. I'm going to be kind-hearted. I'm going to be humble in spirit. I am not going to give evil for evil, insult for insult. I mean, why would you do that? You do it. Why do you do that? You do it to people you love. Insult with insult. They say something to you. You say something back. The next thing, we're, 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 we're boxing all over the house. Physically, you know, not physically, but carnally. He says this, I say that. She says this, I say that. What are you saying? Uh, insult for insult. What is that? That's flesh. That's not spiritual. Well, you think I'm just going to take it? No, you give it to God. You know who can change a person's heart? Not you. Huh? Have you not learned you can't change the other person? Jeez. How long do you have to be miserable before you figure out only God can do that? 
Listen, when he starts doing it to you, you'll believe he could do it to others. The people that don't believe he can do it to somebody else has not let him do it, let him done it to themselves. How should you, when somebody attacks you, you think I'm just supposed to stand there and take it? No, you're supposed to, no, you're supposed to be harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, and humble in spirit. Well, how is that going to happen? Well, you got to be spiritual. Can't be carnal, right? Oh, see, we're never going to read that verse. I mean, you tear that verse and throw it away. You're never going to pay any attention to that verse. That's not going to be one of those verses you're going to memorize and hold it close to your bosom. You're not going to do that. You'd be smart to do it. You'd be really smart to do it because you get on with your life instead of getting stuck someplace where you're miserable. Always talking about, why did I? I shouldn't have ever. In other words, you fall into bad decisions of your life and you think all of that's, that why ha this is what, that's what they did. They've, every time something happened adversely in their life, they went, oh God, bad decision. Why did I ever do this? I should have. Listen, why don't you push on? Why don't you get right with God and push on? You know, all of that shows you're not right with God. Do you not know that that proves that you're not right with God? Because you can't figure out one is one is two. Well, I've been saved 39 years. So what? You live in miserable because you won't adjust your life to the plan of God. Well, I should have never done this 12 years ago and I wouldn't have what I got. I should have never done that 39 years ago. I wouldn't have what I got. No, you should have dealt with it properly with God and you wouldn't have what you got now. And I don't know that anybody believes that God removes sin as far as the east is from the west. You know why? Because you still carry it around. It's a monkey on your back. How far is that? Not farther than my arm. <laughs> That's as far as the east is from the west. There it is, folks, right there. That's how far it is. Am I being too rough on you tonight? Okay. Well, all right. Sometimes medicine's good and sometimes it isn't. I don't know. I'm not going to change what I'm going to tell you. I just thought I'd. Yeah. Here's Joseph's heart. I want you to turn to, I want you to, turn to Genesis 47. Here, here's his heart. Now, we know his heart because we just read it. But, but in the midst of what the brothers, they're just all over. What is, oh, what's going to happen to us? Listen to Joseph's heart. This is Genesis 47, 4 through 7. They'd 45, 45, that's right, 45, 4 through 7. Thank you, whoever read my paper. <laughs> pay close, pay attention to numbers, Don. Always pay attention to numbers. 45, 4. Then Joseph said to his brothers, come closer to me. They came closer, and he said, I am your brother, Joseph whom you sold in slavery, who you sold into Egypt. And now do not be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here for God sent me before you to preserve life. See, there's always good. And if, if you'll stay in that circle of good, he'll show you why. Because it's important for you to see how awesome God is so that his glory can be magnified. Hoo -ah. Oh, that is so good. I hope you got that. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvesting. God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant in the earth and to keep you alive by great deliverance. Whew. Boy, there's a mighty God in his soul. Boy, has this guy moved on? Yes. Not stuck. You know, the brothers have moved on. They're stuck. They're, th they're, they're stuck in a 39-year-old bad decision. That's a long time. They get stuck. Hey, where's your car? It's stuck.
Can you imagine it only had it only had a hundred miles on it? It hasn't been driven since. How come? How come you got this car? It's only got a hundred miles. It's thirty nine years old and only got a hundred miles. Well, you didn't drive much. No, it's been stuck. Well, why didn't you pull it out and drive it? It was stuck. So what? Why don't you get it unstuck? Well, I don't know. There, and there we go. That's called counseling. Yeah. I don't know. Like somebody's slipped up behind you in the middle of the night and you don't know what happened. Except it wasn't the middle of the night and you didn't know what happened. <clears throat> Then in, in verse 20, you, what you meant for evil, God meant for good, right? Listen, unless you know who's talking to the offended, and he's talking to the offender. Now, you're missing this. He says God will do this for you. What you meant for evil, God meant for good. You guys have missed that. You guys have missed that, he says. I've moved on. You haven't, because you've missed the point. What you meant for good for evil, God meant for good. Confess it and get into the good. <laughs> get into the good part of life. Stop being in the muck and the mire. Quit, quit. Here's the second point. Self-condemning guilt is in the ten brothers, but it isn't in Joseph. Because the brothers have failed to seek God's grace in resolving it. They think that Joseph can fix them. Joseph can't fix them. Only God can fix them. When they get his forgiveness, if they don't get it from God, they're still going to be stuck. Sin is against God, not just against man. Be careful. <clears throat> oh, in Genesis 42, <clears throat> I'll show you this. Here's, this. here's the life of these guys for 39 years. Look at verse 4. And, and this is your life, too, if you don't wake up. Here's 42, and this is just typical. I just pull this out. I mean, this happened all the time. I'm just using this example. Verse 21 to 20. I'm in 42, 21, 22. There, things have not gone good for them. Adversity has hit their life. And they said to one another, truly we are guilty concerning our brother. Now, this is another episode. You know, this is like having an automobile accident because you took your eyes off the road for a moment and you hit something. It's your fault, absolutely. And then you say, somebody says, well, what happened? And whatever you tell them, your heart says, God's getting me. God, God, is, God is getting me. Listen to what they said, because the illustration is just about that nutty. Truly, we are guilty concerning our brother, because we saw, now look at, this is the, when something happens, look at, 39 years later, something happens over here that's just enormous, stressful in their life. Immediately, they drop all the way back into their soul, into their consciousness that's been covered up, swept under the rug of consciousness, And here's what they see. This, this is a nightmare. Th listen to me. This is 39 years later, and this is what they see. We saw the distress of his soul when, we, when he pleaded with us, yet we would not listen. Therefore, this distress has come upon us. That's 39 years difference. Do you understand what they saw in their, when they got in distress, it dropped them right back there. God is punishing us. That's not true. 
They're punishing themselves. That distress pushed a, a button 39 floors down and brought it up into the reality, brought it up in technicolor. They're, they're emotional. They're reliving his emotions that they can't get out of their soul and God ain't going to get it out of their soul until they confess the sin. And then it goes on. Just showing you. And listen, this didn't happen one time. Every time they got their life got in a dire strait, when they got into extreme distress, they always went back there. God is punishing us. Well, it's a wake-up call. What they should have done is confess their sin. What they should have done is got right with God, ate to clean up their heart as far as the east is from the west. Whoa. I don't know. I don't know if you'll get it, but I say something else. In chapter 44, let me show you something else. In chapter 44, verse 20 and 43, This is Judah. This is one of the guys struggling. And we said to my Lord, we have an old father and a little child of his old age. Now watch this. And, you know, he's come back out of Egypt talking to his dad and yada, yada. Now his, his, a little child in his old age. Now his brother is dead. You see, he's talking to, he doesn't know him, but he's talking to Joseph in, in Egypt. And, and, he, and he's, make, he's pleading uh, his case. He doesn't know he's talking to Joseph. He said, uh, we said to my Lord, we have an old father and a little child of his old age. Now his brother is dead, so he alone is left. He's talking about Benjamin. He's talking about the brother that's dead he's talking to. So he alone is left uh, of his mother, you remember, that special mother, and his father loves him. Then verse 34, I, I guess. What verse did I put down? 34. For how shall I go up to my father if the lad is not with me? Watch this. Least I see the evil that would overtake my father. How does he know that? Because he did it with Joseph. That's burned in his soul. With a guilt. The guilt is burned in his soul. And every time in adversity comes, he goes back. Now let me tell you what he's got. Let me tell you what he just told Joseph. That Joseph knows different. You know what he just told you? My family has a big secret and it's a lie. Hmm? Come on now. Right? What's the lie? He's not dead. He's not dead. He, that's the big family secret, isn't it? All the brothers have told this lie. This is a big family secret, which is a lie. Nobody talks about it. It's a lie. It's from the pit of hell. It's a lie. It's a cosmos diabolicus lie. Now they're living it as if it was true. But their conscience won't allow it. Because God won't allow it. You're not going to go bed with sin and think that I'm going to support that. God is not letting you go to bed at night and allow you. Okay. I'm just telling you. You can take it, take it for what it's worth. Listen. It's important that you get this. Be careful you do not become what your old man cosmos diabolicus pursues. Because I'm going to tell you, that's the purpose that the devil works your flesh to you, your sin nature. He works your sin nature to get you into a pattern of behavior that you get to believe you can't break. 
I can't tell you how many people I deal with on a monthly basis that believe, as believers, believe they're in a cycle of bad behavior that cannot be broken. And the world lies to them. They tell them that it's, this addiction is a, a disease. A disease. Sin is not a disease. Be careful you do not become what you pursue. The drinker becomes the drunkard. He doesn't have to be. He doesn't have to be. The eater becomes the glutton. He doesn't have to be. The dr drugger becomes the addict. He doesn't have to be. The lazy, become, the lazy person becomes poverty stricken. He doesn't have to be. You do understand that. We're so screwed up as a culture today in America. In the South even. When the South becomes corrupt, there is no hope for America. None. I mean, instead of going to some foreign place to visit, on vacation, pick a place in, in the north, east, or west. Pay attention to the culture there. Jeez. Listen, even if Joseph forgives them, it's not done. They need God's forgiveness. They still have God to deal with. If they think Joseph, listen, Joseph's a piece of cake, right? He was ready for this whole thing in his life. He's been ready for 39 years. First Peter 3.11, he must turn away from evil and do good. He must seek peace and pursue it. That's also Psalms 34.14. The spiritually mature believer leaves the writing of the wrong in the hands of the Lord. You don't have the power to do that. You don't have the power to do that. Romans, the 12th chapter, 17 through 21, would be well worth your read. The brothers, the offenders, were preoccupied with the wrong, while Joseph, the offended, was preoccupied with the right. There's your Colossians. Look at Colossians. Here's your Colossians. Third chapter. Here's the dynamics of this passage. It's an enormous passage. But here's the dynamics of it. Especially when you start reading from verse 1, you wind up in verse 12. You know, it, it's all about uh, putting aside anger and wrath and malice and slander and abusive speech and stop lying to one another and and, and, and put on a new, the new self who's being renewed to the true knowledge. And then he gets down to verse 12 and he, he says, let me tell you why that's important. And so, as those who have been chosen of God, holy, beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another, forgiving each other, Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, also, so also should you. And beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ richly dwell in you. Let it richly dwell with you in wisdom and teaching, admonishing, psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing with thanksgiving in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. That's the name of the game. That's the whole third chapter in the dynamics of living it out. That's a powerful, powerful passage. Paul takes the same thing up in Ephesians 4. They're sister passages. Here's third. 
Jesus taught a lesson that contrasted the difference between a reversionistic heart of the brothers, we call it old man cosmos diabolical thinking, the reversionistic heart of the brothers, and the spiritual heart of Joseph that we refer to as new man divine viewpoint thinking. Over the same period of 39 years, we have completely bo all believers in a completely different journey in their spiritual life. A completely different journey. Matthew 15. Listen to what Jesus taught in Matthew 15. This is what he would have desired for the brothers uh, out of the Jewish age. In 15, 15, 15 through 20, the heart of a man, if you have a study Bible, the heart of man. Peter answered and said, explain the parable to us, Lord. He said, are you still lacking in understanding also? Do you not understand that everything that goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is eliminated? Boy, that's graphic. Hope that wasn't for lunch, before lunch. But the thing that proceeds out of the mouth comes from the heart and defiles the man. It's what is in your heart that defiles you. There's the, there's the ten brothers, right? And how do they know? Because they're living the defilement, aren't they? It, it regurgitates and there it is, right? Right? For out of, the, out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, fornication, theft, false witness, slanders. Boy, that picks the brothers up. These are the things which defile the man, but to eat with unwashed hands did not defile the man. Say they misunderstood the proper use of the law to point them to Christ and get on with their life. I mean, Joseph had done this. The brothers haven't. In, in Luke, in Luke 6.45, the good man out of the good treasures of his heart brings forth what is good. Well, that makes sense, doesn't it? And that would have been enough just to shut it up. Right? That's a positive. If you want good treasures, if you want good treasures, your heart has to be good. And that good, that is good as God is good. And the evil man out of the evil treasures of his heart brings forth what is evil. For the mouth speaks from that which fills his heart. Words do have an effect on our life. And after they're spoken, the other person, no matter what that person says, it's not believed, is it? It is sown. And it struck you as bad because it came from a bad place. Doesn't mean that that bad place can't be changed. But only God can change it. And if you're in here and you have that tendency in your life, you need to stop walking in the flesh and start walking in the spirit because that's how, you're, that's how your first change comes in your life. Instead of going to your flesh and la launching out on something, you go to the Holy Spirit and be kind and work the fruits of the spirit instead of that. Besides, who do you think you are? This is a child of God you're dealing with. You didn't hang up on the cross that privilege. Listen, there's no position in your life over that person that gives you that right. That's a sense of arrogance. If you really understand your position, you wouldn't be doing that. If you really understood that position, what makes you think that you would do something that Christ would never do in a million years? So it tells you what it speaks is what type of heart is speaking. In James 3.18, the seed 
And the seed whose fruit is righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. So, when you're offended, be a peacemaker. Not insult for insult, not evil for evil. Don't go there. The only person that it affects and harms is you. It doesn't change the other person. It's not your job to change them. It's your, your job to pray that God would do a work in his heart. Or her heart. Philippians. And listen. How, how can. Peace. Love. Joy. Peace. Patience. Kindness. Goodness. All of those should be the quickest thing in the world to characterize your life with. Because they're fruit of the spirit. They're all fruit of the spirit. Sown in peace ought to be the simplest thing in the whole wide world. But you've got to go to the Holy Spirit to get it. You've got to be a spiritual person to produce it. How easy is that? Well, the Holy Spirit dwells in your life. How easy is that? Just tap into him and he'll tap it out. Golly, bum. Philippians 4, 7. And the peace of God. Listen to me. And the peace of God. Just talking about the peace of God. And the peace of God. This could be true with any of the fruits. But the peace of God, which, which surpasses all comprehension... See, Joseph has that. There's nothing is going to rock his world from this. Nothing. Any least little backfire of an automobile has got their brothers going like, oh, I hope this is not the day when I have to meet God. I'm a terrible sheep. And the peace of God, talking about the seed of, the seed of righteousness sown in peace, and what does that peace do? The peace of God which surpasses all comprehension will guard, listen to me, will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. Let it do that. If God told me that, I'd take that medicine. Right? But why don't you do this? I mean, I challenge God in a heartbeat. I mean, he promises that to me. I'm all over that promise. Right? I'm all over that. Why would I throw that promise away? I need that promise in my life. I'd grab that in a heartbeat. Of course, I'm just a farm old boy. I was just a farmer. Gone to the city. So I'm not smart as city people. But I know this. When I get a Bible verse like that, I carry that thing with me. I carry that verse with me. God want that. And the, peace will go, and the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension. Are you kidding me? All comprehension? And I don't, that would be enough for me right there. But guard my heart and my mind? That's too good to be true, Bubba. Jeez. Here's my final point. Well, I didn't hear any amen, so I'm still going to give it. Here's my final point. Jo Joseph forgave them based on God's forgiveness of him, whether or not they ever acknowledged their offense against him. Agreed? Because they weren't around when he got this cleaned up. You know, this is a no-brainer for a spiritual mature believer. This, you know what, when they say it's a no-brainer, this is a no-brainer for me. I mean, even a guy like me can figure this out. To me, that's a no-brainer. I don't have to have a degree from Auburn or Alabama to get it. Listen, here's another one. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed until the day of redemption. I'll tell you, when you reach out there and, and do those things that God says don't do, guess what you've just done? You've committed sin that grieves the Holy Spirit. He's not, listen, what he wants to do is work a miracle. 
He wants to work a miracle in your life, and the other person go like, whoa. When I taught my kids about living the new man in Christ, they fed that back to me so much. They fed that back to me. They would say to me, Dad, I'd say, what? I, I'd say, what? <laughs> Could I speak to the new man for a moment? <laughs> it may take more than a moment, honey, but I will get back to you. And boy, were they ever right. See, I, that's the people I lived with. They didn't give no wiggle room. And I, and I tell you, they had to say that a lot for me before it ever cha-chinged. God bless them. God bless them for it. God bless them for it because they were absolutely right. And it was funny. We all have kind of a quirky sense of humor in my family. That worked. I'd go, I'd step back and the Spirit of God would go like, <laughs> <laughs> and I'd go like, Psh, shh. it's not that funny. Yeah, it's funny, it's funny. Let all bitterness, raft, anger, and clamor, and slander, listen, what he says, be put away from you. Cast off. Now, when it doesn't, it doesn't mean, you know, look, for, for us, it's a, it's a sack of garbage. You put it out on the street. The truck comes along on Wednesday at my house and picks it up. I'm not going to follow him to get it back, and I'm not going to dump to get it back. So I'm very careful what goes in it because I am not going to get it because it's not junk. It's garbage. Now, I might go for junk, but I ain't not going for garbage. That's what this is. Put it, when you put it away, put it away. When you put it off, put it off. Put it off and keep it off. Put it off and keep it off. Put it off and keep it off. Ed Jones was here. He'd have a song Sunday. Put it off and keep it off. He'd have had a song for us. He's the darndest guy to come up with lyrics. How do you know that you've put it off and it's off? How do you know it? Look at the next verse. The very next verse tells you. See, I just read Ephesians 4.31. Here's Ephesians 4.32. Be kind to one another. Tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as God in Christ forgave you. That's how you know, because your behavior changes. The same thing that used to get you wiped out, mad as an old wet hen, <laughs> old man speaking. Same incident comes up, a different guy shows up to deal with it. Different guy. That's how you know. You handle the old situations in a completely new way and are content with it. Not phony baloney that puts it on as a front and then stabs you in the back. Oh, yes, oh, yes, I forgive you. Now that phony baloney stuff. Be kind to one another. That's verse 32. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving. That's how you know you've put it off. Because you kind of shocked yourself. Wow, I was, I normally, I normally get really upset there. Wow. I'm actually, actually acting decent here. And everybody goes like, is that okay? I don't know, let's just wait and see. Listen, Jesus did the same thing in Luke 23, 34. 
Stephen did the same thing in Acts 7, 39, and now it's up to us to do it because it's a biblical principle, okay? Work on it. That's your homework. <laughs> uh, assigned to you from God, yeah. Um, next week, we're going to... Uh, next week, guys. Uh, it's last... This is the last Tuesday. Tuesday. And we're going to... I want to try to bring the sal different salads, fruit salad, macaroni salad, whatever salad I you know, would like to bring. And I'm going to go and get some chicken tenders and stuff to go along with the salad. Okay. Boy, watermelon right now. Have you had watermelon lately? It is out of sight. It's so good. But anyway, that, and, and please bring something to drink. Okay. Bring something to drink? Yes. Like tea. Oh. <laughs> I want to clarify myself. Oh, okay. I just... Go along with the flow, right? Let me have a word of prayer and, and let the Internet people go away, and then we'll have our private prayer time. Here we do it. Father, we're so thankful for these that have come our way to study with us, both by automobile and Internet. We pray, Father, the people on the Internet would, would understand that it's really important to pick out a day, at least one day a week with us, and stay consistent. Pick out a Tuesday and stay with us on Tuesday. Pick out a Wednesday, stay with us on Wednesday or a Sunday, stay with us. You can pick more days than that, however, but the consistency of a study level is very important. For example, this is our second lesson in this subject matter. It's not our first lesson. It is our second one. We have built off from our first one. So I pray the Lord would touch your heart in that regard because that's very often the way we do. We pick up series of ideas and studies uh, on subject matter uh, from the Word of God. Father, we pray for this. Tonight, we thank you for this lesson. We pray, Father, we would take it seriously. Uh, we don't need to be carrying this kind of baggage around. Christ has taken care of all that. We need to move on. We need to move on with God, not just move on. For we made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life.